So let's just do a quick review. Um, I trust that you've engaged and enjoyed uh, exploring the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the biggest blessing to me is listening to it every day and just more and more emerges from it and more and more of it sticks in my heart and mind uh, so I can carry it around with me. Lots of ways to engage this in your small groups. Tomorrow night, Monday at 6.45, I go hang out at Horrocks, and whoever shows up, we talk about the Sermon on the Mount. It's a great atmosphere. It's a lot of fun. If you want to do that tomorrow night, you're welcome to be there. Uh, just I learned this, though. It's in the seating area where the stage is, okay? Not where the cash register is, but where the stage is. Um, so I'll have to be more clear about that in the future. So there I am. I'm, I've done it. Um, so there's this thing that we started with. Um, in ver it's almost in the middle of the sermon, and I think it's the goal. Uh, it, it's kind of the point. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And I know that's language that, you know, we have to get our heads around that for a, a moment. What do we mean by being perfect? Well, our Father in heaven is perfect in the sense that, well, he's perfect in every way, but specifically how we're to imitate that is to be unmixed in our love for him. And therefore, unmixed in our love for others. That there's another, uh, uh, not other currents or streams running through there of, of something that I want to get for myself. It is a complete whole love for God. And, and the promise is that when you live like that, when you, when you strive to love God like that, he begins to put your life together in a way that's called the blessed life or the good life. And it looks like this. Uh, you get in right relationship with God. And then he is working it out for you to be in right relationship with one another in such a way that your life promotes goodness and justice and you live for the sake of others. And he says that's the good life. And he talks about a higher righteousness, a, a right living, where it, it doesn't nullify the law of the Old Testament. It fulfills that. It goes to the heart of it. He talks about religious practices that, boy, there's all kinds of religious people out there that go through the minutiae of religious practices. But he talks about what the heart of it is about. And then he talks about right relationships. How are we to love one another? And then also about our resources, how we're to uh, see our resources and how do we engage them. And that's where we're at this morning. We're going to talk about that idea of resources. Now, uh, Jesus and Matthew have done us a big favor. Uh, they have organized it in a way that it's really easy to follow. I know I'm not always easy to follow, but Jesus and Matthew are easy to follow. Uh, well, at least in this passage, Jesus can be uh, you know, a little more, more of a struggle to follow sometimes, but he'll help you. Uh, but in this, he's already helped us. So here, here it is. It's very simple. In this passage we're going to read, you're going to see two treasures, two eyes, two masters, and two mindsets. So with that in mind, if you'll stand with me, we'll read Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 34. This is Jesus speaking. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now the eye is the lamp of the body. And if your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are, they, are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? So why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field that is here today, 
and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will have uh, enough trouble of its own. Or in the NIV that I just uh, have in front of me here, it says, therefore, <laughs> if sometimes you go from memory, that's not always good. Uh, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And this is the word of the Lord for us today. Great, you can be seated. So the dynamics here is, is what is true lasting wealth? What, what's your dis, disposition towards the things that you have and the things that you need? And when you get this priority right, Jesus says, now you're entering into the good life. So let's talk about the, the two treasures, the two eyes, the two masters, and the two mindsets. The two treasures, verses 19 through 21. There's this great image here of, hey, if you're storing up stuff that's vulnerable, you know, the moth can eat it, uh, the vermin come in and destroy it, thieves can take it away. Um, it's, it's talking about the corrosiveness of, of time and forces in the world that are inevitable. In fact, as I was thinking about this, you know, there's uh, so many people in this congregation that had a good life in another country. And for things outside their control, things begin to change, and all of a sudden, they had to leave it all. And I know a few of them that came and lived just scratching through every day, even though they were professionals and had resources where they came from, and it was gone like that. And they had to figure out where their trust was at. The other thing I remember was I, when we used to live in the Detroit area, uh, there's this website called the Vanishing Detroit. And you can see these neighborhoods and these homes that are just beautiful homes at one time. But over the years, they just start to, the moth, the vermin, and the decay, and the thieves stealing stuff out of the houses. Uh, my in-laws lived in Detroit. They talked about what a great place it was to live, how much they loved their neighborhood, and, and how people were together. And so I went and Googled the street that they lived on, which is Ohio Street in Detroit. And uh, every house, like it's like three houses that are falling down, grown over, and then one that someone's trying to maintain. Uh, this is the neighborhood that they used to love. And so we, we know that's true, that the things that are treasures today will be trash tomorrow. And we have this odd proclivity to crave what is fading. Uh, the great uh, philosopher Schopenhauer, he said, wealth is like seawater. The more we drink, the thirstier we become. Or you might be familiar with Rockefeller. He said this when he was asked, well, how much is enough? And his reply was, well, just a little bit more. Those are great, and those are uh, really wise and wealthy people. But I think I got the best perspective for me uh, from an old relative that loved to fish. I'm, I'm not a fisherman, but he loved to fish, so he wanted to talk about fishing also. And so he's telling me stuff that I'm not really sure I want to know, but I, I know it anyway now. Um, and he said this, you know, Craig, to, to catch a fish, you got to think like a fish. And when I thought about him, I'm like, well, that makes a lot of sense because it seems like you think like a fish. Um, but he said, yeah, he said, actually some good wisdom here. He said, you know, fish, they are all about maximizing gratification of their appetite and minimizing expenditures of energy. Get all you can with as less effort as you can. So he said, basically, here's, here's the fish life. You see a fly, you want a fly, you want to eat the fly. And that's what the blessed life is for the fly, or for the, the uh, fish, not for the fly. Uh, uh, but for the fish, if you can eat the fly, that's the blessed, blessed life. And so I'm watching people fish, and, you know, it's kind of fun to watch the, uh, the salmon and the trout stuff. And 
I don't think they really ever reflect on the meaning of life, though. I don't, you know, I've never seen a fish on a hook going, oh, what's it all about? Uh, you never see that. You don't see fem a female carp saying to her male carp partner, I don't think you're as committed to this relationship as I am. <laughs> Do you love me? And are you interested in me? Are you just interested in my eggs? I, I, you never hear a carp say that. So fish are mostly a collection of appetite and instinct, uh, basically driven by, by their stomach, their mouth, and their eyes. And I, I don't know if I'm right about this, but to me it just seems like fish are incredibly dumb. So we go out and fly fish, you know, and say, hey fish, uh, swallow this. It, it's not the real thing, it's just a lure. But we tease them to say, this will satisfy your appetite. And what you don't tell them is the part is, is when you snap at that, that lure has a hook in it. And that hook will capture you and reel you in and do you in. Fish are dumb. And they've been falling, falling for this, I guess, for eons now. Um, they've never wised up. They've never figured it out. I, I don't know why they haven't, you know, like, oh, this is not a good idea. So I thought, you know, they may swim in schools, but they won't really ever learn anything. Um, and I just was thinking, boy, aren't we glad we're not like fish? That we're not just about instincts and appetites, stomach, mouth, and eyes. But those are the two treasures that are laid before us. That, that can lure us, that can promise things that you really can't deliver, and that someday it's going to go away. So there's these two eyes that Jesus talks about, verses 22 and 23. And essentially he's saying, don't be fish-eyed. Um, two eyes. So the one eye, the one focus is good. That you have your vision, you have your focus on the right things. And Jesus says, when you get your eyes turned to the right things, they're not always the shiny things your life will be luminous, like from the inside out. But if you focus on the wrong things, if you are distracted by the things that promise but can't always deliver, he says that your life will be full of darkness. Your focus determines your life. The good eye is generous, and actually the language of it that speaks to that. The good eye is generous. The other eye is nearsighted, it's the blind eye, and it's evil, and it's loveless, and it is greedy. I sometimes read lyrics to songs. I, I love music. I love to, like old hymns, like from the Wesleyan and from the hymnals that are in your pew rack there, and, and other old things, and, and songs of all kinds. I, I love to, to read them as part of just devotional time. And this week, when I was thinking about the two eyes, anybody want to just take a stab at the old, an old song in your hymnal that I might have thought of? Because some of you, I found out some of you know this song. There's this song about eyes. Anybody want to take a stab? Just, did some, well, I think I heard it. His eyes on the sparrow, that's one. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. So that song, without me having to go look it up and come find a hymnal here, was just resonating through my mind all week long. Oh soul, are you wearied and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light with a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Boy, that line there captures a lot of the Sermon on the Mount. And then this beautiful chorus. Now, I would love to sing this for you. Um, I'm not gonna do it. In my mind, I'm singing it. Um, but Jesus has told me, like my prayer life, um, which is alone in the closet, that's my singing life as well. Um, but this is a beautiful lyric. And in my car, I give it all I got. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Man, I have found that to be true over the years. The things of earth strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. 
So you have the two treasures. You have the two eyes of where your focus is at. And then this challenge, um, you have two masters, verse 64. And it talks about this dynamic of money, but really the way it's used here, uh, it, it, it's focused on money, but it really expands to anything that we want to possess that we think gives us a good life. And we know that money has significant power in our lives. I mean, as much as we would want to deny this, money often shapes who we are and how we feel about ourselves. And money can reveal our motivations. Money can disclose our real desires. And, and money can expose our intentions. And money can really shine a light on the things that we really desire and love. So we have this thing where we thank God for the material blessings, but when they get a grip on us, when, they, when we start to trust in those things, when we start to find our security in those things, when we start to find our self-esteem in those things, and when we begin to worry over those things, we know that something has a grip on us that can do us in because we are suddenly building our lives and our identity on valuables, at least to us, that are nothing more than disposable goods. And the problem is, nobody would say, I'm superficially materialistic. No, nobody's going to say that. Well, you might, but I, don't, I haven't met too many people that would say that. The problem is, is it's so sneaky. It just filters its way into our lives. And it's hard for us to see sometimes. That's, that's why I think you need to be before the Lord and have him examine you. There's a great group of theologians there called the OJs. Um, if, you can Google it if you're young, younger than me. Probably 50 or younger, you have to Google that. They had a great insight talking about money. Money, money, money. For a small piece of paper, it carries a lot of weight. Uh, that should be in the hymnal, by the way. Uh, that song has got a lot of good gospel in it. So when you think about material blessings. I know a lot of people, I, I've heard this preached, that material blessings is a sign of God's blessing in your life. That, that it's an important sign that, that God is blessing you and you're doing the right things and, and he's going to give you the good life. I would just challenge you to say, <coughs> to, to rather rethink that whole concept. Because if, if blessings are a sign of God's blessings, if, if your wealth and your material things are a sign of God's blessing, I mean, you can have a really nice car, but drug dealers have nice cars. Um, you can have some really beautiful homes, but frankly, uh, Jeffrey Epstein and um, Harvey Weinstein and Vladimir Putin have or have had really nice homes. So I'm not sure that we want to equate God is blessing me by the amount of material things that I have and how my, work, my life is working out so smoothly. So we thank God for the blessings. But when we begin to put those in front of God, we're being duped. Uh, we're thinking of things that are temporary and disposable as if they're valuable and eternal. So we manage it, but we don't get captured by it. We hold this, we have a loose grip on it. Because one of these days, that wealth is either going to leave you or you're going to leave it. I was trying to remember, I, I was thinking about this in, in preparation for this message, and I started to try to count all the funerals that I've done in my time as a pastor. And I came with, up with a number of too many to count. I, don't, I can't remember. It's a lot. Here's what I've never seen, never once. I have never seen a eulogy where they read a bank statement. Never seen that. I, I've never seen a eulogy where they bring out the real estate portfolio. I, I've, I've never seen anybody um, like just admired and praised over all the amazing cars they had during their lifetime. Never seen that once. Jesus says, here's the competition. You can serve me or you can serve money. You can trust in me or you can trust in your money. You can find worth in me or you can find worth in your money. You can seek security in me or you can seek security in your money. You can cling close to me 
or you can clean, cling close to your money. You can find joy in me, or you can try to find joy in your money. You can depend on me, or you can depend on your money. And basically says to us, well, well which is it? Because you can't do both. There's no way to do both. If you trust in and you cling to your stocks, your salary, your possessions, your material success, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. You are trusting and building your house on the wrong foundation. So if you take the money and say, this is where I'm going to invest and, and put all my efforts and attention to, God won't force you. He'll, he'll step back. He'll let you do things your own way. But he will never be junior God. He will never be co-God. He will never be conciliatory God. He, he is either God over all or he is not God at all. So it's one thing to have material things, to have wealth. It's a dangerous and damning thing for that wealth to have you. It will do you in. So Jesus talks about one of the things that we can see, I mean, it just will be kind of like a warning light going off in our, our lives, is what kind of mindset do you have? There's two mindsets. If, if your mindset is excessive, chronic worry over the things of this earth, I mean, I know we have anxieties about all kinds of things, but if it's excessive and chronic, that's a sign of disordered desires and a misplaced trust, right? You know, worry doesn't stop or solve tomorrow's trouble. It just robs you of today's peace. Or I really like what Corey Ten Boom said. She said, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows. It just empties today of its strength. So you have a choice. We have a choice. You can choose to take your worry and turn it into prayer. Or you can take your worries and turn it into a burden that you have to carry around. You can take your anxieties and fears, and those things can move you into deeper trust in God, or they can move you into a trap that you fall into, and it's a dark place. So how you see money, how, how you see possessions, how you see desires for these things, it has a lot to do with how you use it, your perspective on it. Some cling to it, others spread it around generously. Some invest it, some spend it wildly. Some people use it carefully, others, they'll drink it, they'll smoke it, they'll gamble it, they'll Amazon it, they'll do all those things. Some people will keep it in the bank, others will hang it in their closet. Some will see it as a means to bless others. Others will see it as a means to impress others. And some people are thankful for it, and other people just ruminate and worry over it. So the question is, do, do you trust God? M more so than other things. So last week, Lynn and I had some time together. We were in the car for a couple hours, and we just started reflecting on all the things that have happened in our lives. Uh, times where we're like, wow, how's this going to work out? How, how's, is this the right decision? Uh, is there going to be enough? Uh, how will we make these adjustments? And in every situation, God had us. In every situation, he always came through. In every situation, we learn something that drew us closer to him. And you know, there's this song, it's a really goofy song, but I love the theology behind it, even though it's a secular song. I wish there were more bad times. Uh, because there's something that you learn about God's love and the ability to trust him, bad times. And so we were, in our own little way, saying, you know, I wish there were more bad times because we have learned so much and seen so much of God in times where we just had to lean on him and trust him. Hey, he knows 
we need shelter. He knows we need food. He knows we need clothes. Just make sure that you're storing up the right treasures. Just make sure that you, you have the correct focus, that your eyes are good. Just make sure that you're serving the right master. And be sure that you are cultivating the right mindset. Jesus said it in verse 33. Here's what you should do. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Heavenly Father, help us to trust you. There are so many lures, so many things that subtly, deceptively move us to pursue it, thinking it will satisfy us, that it, this is the answer. But Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a wisdom to know that the good life is when you are at the center. The good life is not always the easy life, but it is the life that brings blessing to others and to us. And so I ask that you would give us the confidence by the work of your Holy Spirit in our hearts and minds that we can trust you fully with all things. And we'll let the worry flutter into the sky and stand on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray.